morning, Crossroads. This is a beautiful day that the Lord has made. We're thankful for the rain, and we're thankful when the rain stops. <laughs> um, and so today, we are going to give all of our praises and all of our attention to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So if you would like to stand and worship with us. I surrender, I surrender, oh, it's whatever you say, you got, it's whatever you say, you got, I surrender, I surrender, oh, it's whatever you say, you got, it's whatever you say, you got, I surrender.
morning, church. We are so excited that you are here worshiping in this space with us this morning. This morning, If you're joining us online now or later, we are also excited that you are tuning in today or later this week. Um, my name is Danae Christ, and I am the youth director here and just want to welcome you into this space. Um, just a couple of quick announcements before we continue in worship together next Sunday, which is the 21st. Right after this service and the 11 o'clock service, um, confirmands are going to be baptized and or remember their baptism. And we're actually going to do it on campus this year. And so after the service, if you would like to be a part of that, which I would really encourage you to do, you can walk down um, to the creek um, where the pavilion, I'm not really sure what that's called, but over that way. Um, and we will get to celebrate together. Um, the baptisms of these confirmands. And then the following Sunday, the 28th, will be the confirmation service. So it will be a combined service in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock. Um, so just put that on your radar um, for the next two weeks. So if you would go ahead and greet one another this morning, give a hug, a high five, um, welcome one another into the space. You can find your way back to your seat and go ahead and have a seat once you are there. This morning for our mission moment, um, we are going to be learning a little bit more about Burundi missions and dreaming for change. So check out this video to learn a little more. Amahoro Bon United Methodist Church. Amahoro means peace in my local language, Kiwondi. Seven years ago, I was here in Bonn at Appalachian State University for the Mandela Washington Fellowship Program. During the end of the program, all the Mandela Fellows were asked to develop their action plan. Guess what was my action plan? Dreaming for change. And The Lord has been so faithful to me in my missionary work of serving the rural communities, uh, strengthening families, and supporting individuals. The Lord has put people in my life who believed in my dreams and hopes. And together, we have, number one, established a community school, which provides early childhood education and life experience which will give rural children the chances for success in school. Our school currently serves 150 children in preschool and primary school, grade one and two. We have established the childhood and maternal nutrition program. We serve a nutritious meal daily to more than 450 children and postnatal mothers who suffer from malnutrition. We have been strengthening the local economic developments of women and girls through the Village Saving and Loan Associations, which is VSLA. Today, we have 650 women in the VSLA program. We are running the Girls' Scholarship Fund to support high school girls from poor families with tuition, sanitary parts, school supplies, mentorship, and the after-school program to help them stay in school and develop their life goals. Currently, we have 
40 girls in the scholarship program. Last year, we built the Hope Renewal Center, which is a youth space, a vocational training space, a computer room and library that the young people will use to enrich their minds, grow their ideas, and build a better community. Dreaming for Change is blessed to have different supporters, including the Boone United Methodist Church, which has contributed to a porridge and nutrition program. This year, we plan to transition from providing porridge to promoting home gardens and community farming which will enhance food security and nutritional health in the community. Thank you for your prayers, support, and contribution to the people of Burundi, to the work of Dreaming for Change. God bless. One of the things our, um, I'm super proud of this church for is just how missionally minded it is. And so um, the fact that we can, we can uh, support and, and, and do what we do for Dreaming for Change uh, is absolutely incredible. Um, so my name is Ben Fitzgerald. I, uh, I normally am uh, playing guitar up there, but this morning I'm going to be uh, actually giving the message, um, so you feel free to tune out at any point. Um, but, but I, uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited, I'm, I'm really thankful for, um, for Vern to be able to give me this opportunity to, to speak, and then I'm also excited that Vern gets to, um, to be away and to, to be with, um, his daughter on her, uh, volleyball tournament, and so, uh, it's just really important that we give our pastors that 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 chance. Um, so uh, we're, we what we usually do is um, open up uh, our time of, of prayer. And um, if you, uh, we have a few from our, our um, church congregation that we want to lift up. Um, Addie Bobbitt, uh, who is um, undergoing outpatient surgery um, on Monday, uh, so we can be in prayer for for Addie and uh, Craig Ferguson begins uh, prostate cancer treatment also on, on Monday. Um, and then Sherry Prather's brother, uh, Wayne Buckles, um, was just recently diagnosed with uh, brain and, and bone cancer. Uh, so we're, we'll, we'll lift up those in prayer. Um, does anyone here uh, at this point in time have any prayer requests that they'd like to lift up? Um, Danae has a microphone, so she'll pass that around. Um, yeah, Polly. <laughs> uh, there is a pharmacist in Banner Elk that had shoulder surgery twice, and he, I believe it just from our talks that I've agreed to stand in prayer for him because. Mm -hmm with limitations and range of motion, et cetera, um, we can lose faith really easy. So Absolutely. let's lift Tom up for complete, like let's give him a miracle. Mm. Amen. Thank you. Anyone else? Rodney? Just the world news, the, the tensions that have developed, the attack, and, and so forth. So we're really at a uh, precipitous time, and maybe God's people's prayers can avert the growing hostilities. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, my. Uh, if you want to unmute Sarah. <laughs> my stepmom. Her name is Pat. Um, she has peripheral artery disease, and she's having. A lot of complications with that, some aneurysms, and um, a lot of pain, and she's just really um, discouraged because she cannot uh, 
go anywhere. Um, she, and she also has COPD. So um, just pray for her, um, just for her physical body and her also her emotional state. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just for Garrett, he sprained his foot. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. So his baseball season's done. Um, and also we have a crew over in Jordan. So I just, um, our Chris Meredith's person, just pray that they get back safely. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Let's open up uh, in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Oh, Lord God, you are um, the God of comfort, the God of peace. You are the God who um, can heal all things, Lord. And we just pray this morning that you are lifting up all of these, all of these requests, all of the burdens that are on our hearts, whether they've been spoken or unspoken. Um, God, we just ask that you lay a blessing on all of us. Um, God, we pray um, for Addie Bobbitt. We pray for her surgery, that it, is, that it goes well and that you're, you're orchestrating the hands of the surgeons, um, God. And we pray for Craig Ferguson, um, Lord, and the, the treatments for, for cancer, um, God, that you are just in and among all of that, um, God, and for uh, Wayne Buckles. Um, God, it's... it's um, one of the scariest things to have realized that you have been diagnosed with, with brain and bone cancer, God, and we just we just ask that you that you be with them and that you be with their families, um, God, and that you just allow us to um, wrap them up with love and, and support, um, God. Uh, we be with, uh, we ask that you um, look over uh, Tom um, and his. Uh, so shoulder surgery, God, that you are healing that, and, and again, just working with, with, with uh, and alongside the doctors there. Um, God, we pray that you, uh, as Rodney said, God, just the, the world that we live in, um, we see so much hurt and hardship and, and pain and suffering, God, but, but we know that you are bringing it all to fruition, God, that you are working even in the dark places, God, especially in the dark places. And we just ask that you allow there to be uh, a ceasing in the violence, allow there to be a hope for all of those that are, that are suffering, God. We just pray that you um, be with all the families um, who are just trying to, to live day to day, and God. We ask that you be with um, Sarah's uh, stepmom, Pat. Um, God, be with her. Be with the healing of her heart, but also the, the, the healing with her emotions. Um, Lord, that you, uh, that you provide a, a way for her to, to, feel, um, to feel some sense of, of normalcy, God, even in, in the pain. And, and God, we pray for Garrett's foot. Um, and for all of those that are, are traveling with Samaritan's Purse and, and that, you, um, that you heal what needs to be healed and you, and you allow the safe traveling, um, uh, God, and the safety of all of those that are, that are, doing, um, that are doing work, God. We, just, uh, we pray that you be with us this morning. We pray that you allow us to open our hearts in worship. Um, bring us to a place where we can come and encounter you in a new way, Lord that uh, the words that we sing, the praise that we pray, and the words that we hear are uh, acceptable in your sight. God, we just ask that you let, this Holy, let your Holy Spirit flow through every corner of this place and that it spills out into the rest of the world. God, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. If you feel led, please stand with us as we continue in worship. Oh, 
come to understand what it simply means to just lean into what you are doing in our lives. God, we are so grateful that when you're
your son died on the cross and forgave us for our sins, he outpoured a grace that humanity had never known before. Got him when he rose from the dead. The power that gave us the ability to resurrect with him. God, we just thank you so much. I pray that everyone in this room and beyond knows and understands your grace. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, you are our strength. You are our redeemer. Amen. You can be seated. There is a, a pretty significant difference between knowing what Jesus could do and believing what Jesus will do. You know, we've, we've, we've heard these stories, we've seen these things, we, we, we know, we, we, can, we can have like this understanding, this knowledge that, that Jesus can do some things, right? And there are, there, are, there are many examples of what Jesus could do, but what would it look like for us to truly believe what Jesus will do, or, or better yet, what Jesus is currently doing right here, right now. The former, it takes a little bit of belief, but it, it, it and that it also, it, it kind of just takes um, a little bit of the imagination. Um, in, in my household, um, my, my oldest son, uh, Thomas, he, um, he's getting all into the superheroes. And, and so we've been really, we've been loving watching uh, him get into like the Disney Junior has um, like a Disney Spider-Man thing. Um, and I think they've got like the Hulk and the Iron Man coming in with it. Um, and so uh, he loves that. He loves um, anytime, if you've heard of the Paw Patrol, um, if you have little kids, certainly you have. Um, but if he loves it when the Paw Patrol like, I think there was some meteor or something that comes down and gives them all superpowers. Um, but he, that's his, that's Thomas's bread and butter. Like, he, he loves when the Paw Patrol become the mighty pups um, and they get these superpowers. Um, so following along with that track, we've, uh, we've introduced to him for the first time uh, Disney Pixar's The Incredibles. And he loves The Incredibles. Um, if you don't know, if you've never seen it, it's, it's basically a, a, a Pixar movie about superheroes, about a family dynamic and how they, how they work through be, having superpowers. Um, and one of the characters that my son really connects with is, naturally, Dash, who is, um, his, his power is being incredibly fast. That's why his name is Dash. He can dash. He's Super speedy. Um, and so we're watching this movie for the first time, and there's this scene where, where Dash, he's, he's, he's running away from the bad guys. He's going as, as, as fast as he can, and the bad guys are driving these little, I don't know what you call them. They're something. They're driving something to get fast. Anyways, so, he, uh, so Dash is running as fast as he can, and this body of water starts coming up, and Dash, he closes his eyes uh, because he doesn't know what's going to happen, and then he keeps on running, and he opens his eyes, and suddenly he realizes he's running on water because he's going so fast. And my son, who had, had he saw that scene and then he had also just um, gone to uh, children's church and we read um, from our, our children's Bible every night. And so he, he had just heard the story about Jesus walking on the water. And so he points to the TV and he says, that's just like Jesus. <laughs> Aw. And, and um, so, you know, I was, it, was such a, it was such a neat thing that he had made, that he had been able to make that connection. And, and it really, what it did for us was it gave us the ability to open up that conversation and, and to be able to say like, man, that's, that's right. I mean, yeah, Jesus did. He walked on water. And um, now, you know, you're watching this movie and, and I'm not trying to burst 
my kids' bubbles, but I, I did share with them, you know, this is, this is fun, and it's entertaining, and it's a movie, and it's, you know, it, but it is still pretend, right? And, you know, Tom was like, yeah, I know, it's pretend. I get that. Um, and I said, you know what the neat thing is? Jesus is not pretend. And, you know, he, he, he like, just eyes wide, like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah. He really walked on water. Um, and, and he was like, wow, that's so crazy. How did he do that? And, uh, and I, was, I just said, well, you know, he's, he's the son of God. And, and, and if God created everything, then, then God can pretty much do anything, right? And so because he is God's son, he can do anything. And, and his, I mean, his world just expanded like crazy in that moment. And I, and I love, I, I've said this to a few friends of mine, but I love the thing I love about being a dad is, is being able to watch those little minds just blow. Um, it's, so, it's so cool. Um, but again, like that's, that takes a little bit of imagination to be able to say, like, yeah, Jesus did that. Yeah, we read these stories, and, and we can know that Jesus could do these things. And, and, and for Thomas, you know, it opened up the discussion of a whole lot of other things. Like, okay, well, can, can Jesus fly? Can Jesus uh, shoot fire out of his hands? Can Jesus, you know, we, watch, we also watched Moana, so... Uh, my youngest daughter really loves that movie, and so Thomas was like, can, can Jesus walk on lava? And I'm, like, I'm you know what, but I'm sure he could. Um, if he wanted to, he could probably walk on lava, but um, like I said, we, like, we, have these, we have these things that we know, we, like, yes, Jesus can do these things. He probably could do such and such, but what does it really look like for us to fully believe what Jesus would do, will do in you. There's a difference. You know, the, the former is a stretch of the imagination. The latter really, really has bearing on our lives. It really, it changes, or at least it should, right? It changes who we are on a day-to-day -day basis. What we, what we do, it, 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 it affects us in a real way. Things become very, very real. So the disciples throughout the Gospels, they kind of, they, they somewhat struggled with this concept, right? They, I mean, they had seen Jesus do a lot of different things. They had seen him walk on water. They had seen him, uh, like, heal the sick and give sight to the blind. They had seen him, I mean, he even raised Lazarus up from the dead. And, and then Jesus, he even told them, look, I'm going to suffer these things, and I'm going to die, and then I'm going to enter into my glory, and then I'm going to rise again. And he even gave them a specific timeline. He said, three days I will rise from the dead. But for whatever reason... The disciples really struggled with this. Now, whether it was from a, like a, a lack of, of faith, whether it was just a struggle to believe, or whether their minds just simply couldn't, couldn't wrap their heads around like the, the concept that someone could actually raise themselves up from the dead, I don't know. But for whatever reason, the disciples, when they, when they looked at Jesus, they, they, they knew who he was, and they had, they had met this pre-risen from the dead Jesus, but they didn't believe, they didn't know, they didn't understand that they would one day get to meet the risen Jesus. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to be starting off this uh, sermon series this week called Meet the Risen Jesus. Uh, two weeks ago, we celebrated Easter as a church about how Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, and then last week, we, we had our healing service. And, then, and so for this week, we are starting, um, we're going to look at different instances uh, leading up to Pentecost, where we're going to talk about uh, the different encounters that Jesus' disciples or followers experienced when he, as the risen Savior, had come and introduced and revealed uh, himself to them. Um, and I, I'm honestly, I'm honored that I get to be the one uh, to kickstart this uh, series. So let's go ahead and get the, the ball rolling, and we can open up um, to our Luke chapter uh, 20, excuse me, 24. Um, we're going to be starting with verse 13. If you have your Bibles, you can open up with us. If you don't, uh, it should be on the screen. But this is Luke chapter 24, starting with verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. 
They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and all and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us what that they had seen, a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if they were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So here we have these, these two travelers, um, Cleopas, and then, and then we kind of don't get the name of, of the second person, but there are many who speculate that it was uh, Cleopas' wife, um, Mary. And, you know, despite what uh, some of, like, the older um, paintings and, and what older things uh, have depicted of this moment being two men, uh, most are starting to believe that it was uh, Cleopas and his wife Mary because there was a reference um, to Cleopas in, in John's gospel where uh, the, the people who were standing next to Jesus' mother Mary were Mary and her husband Cleopas. Um, and so they were present for uh, the, 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 the crucifixion. They were there and they saw when Jesus died on the cross and they were, they were present for all of this. They probably weren't there for the Passover feast. Uh, that was pretty much between Jesus and his disciples, but they were there for the, for the death on the cross. They were followers of Jesus. And then we know that they were there for when Mary Magdalene had seen that the tomb was empty and had gone to the other disciples and those gathered around them uh, and had said, like, the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. But they, but they, didn't, they didn't believe it. It says um, in verse 11, if we kind of go back a few a few verses, it, it says they didn't, they didn't believe what the women had said because it sounded to them like nonsense, that Jesus would, would rise from the dead. So they're, they're, on, this, they're on this road, and, and it says in Luke's gospel that the road is about seven miles long, um, and because of like, the terrain, it's, it's pretty flat, and, and we could probably guess that the, the Romans had, had taken care of it pretty well. Um, so it maybe not as nice and as paved as it is on the Greenway Trail, but it'd be similar to like starting off the Greenway Trail at, at the Deerfield Street entrance and then going all the way to um, Brookshire Park uh, on the other side, the new addition that they made to that trail um, underneath the, the 421 bridge, and then back. So that distance and back was probably around the same, a, a similar time frame. So, you know, a nice leisurely afternoon walk, right? Um, and, and, and so... Um, but we have this, uh, we have this moment where, where this, this stranger comes 
and, and meets up with them. Now this is something that, that, that usually kind of, it, it's sort of normal for folks while they're walking to invite a stranger to come walk with them. For us, probably now, we'd probably look at that and be like, oh, well, hold on, stranger danger. Um, but, you know, back then, they, they, like, the road was so much more dangerous um, that in order to, to stop from being robbed, like, the, the more people you had, basically, in your group of, of, of travelers, um, the less likelihood you'd be robbed or, or attacked or something like that. But anyways, they, they, they were talking about all these things. They were talking about, you know, the, the, what had happened on the cross. And again, they didn't believe um, that Jesus was ridden, risen. And um, there's a, a Christian author named Brian Bantam who, who writes about, you know, this, this notion that they, they couldn't believe. So he's, he says, Jesus' followers struggled to fathom this new world that rang from an empty tomb. They could make sense of Palm Sunday, of miracles, of his rereadings of the prophets. Maybe he could, they could even uh, make sense of his violent death at the hands of the empire. They had surely seen that before, but life after the tomb was unfathomable. So, for whatever reason, this stranger comes up, and Luke's gospel, you know, he, he, the way it's described, like, it, it, he doesn't... Um, you know, basically Luke needs to have like a spoiler alert tag on him at all times. We don't get to have like the, the emotional response that Cleopas and his wife do by re the reveal that it's Jesus. Luke pretty much tells us, by the way, it's Jesus. Um, but they don't know that. Cleopas and his wife, they don't, they don't know that this is Jesus coming up to them. To them, it's just a stranger. And so um, he's joined in with the conversation. And, you know, I, I love how... Um, <laughs> how Jesus just kind of walks up to them, and, and you know, he, he got to believe that he was messing with them, because he knows what they're talking about, right? I mean, he, they're, they're talking about him, so he's the thing, he's the, like the subject of the conversation, and he comes up to them and says, hey, what you guys talking about? Um, and their response is, is, is pretty accurate, you know, they're like, uh, have you been living under a rock? This, like, Jesus, like, are, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know that Jesus uh, was, was put on the cross and that he died, and there's this huge, this huge to-do. Um, and Jesus, his response is, okay, well, tell me what's, what's been happening. And I, I, love, I, love this, um, I love this way that Jesus says this. Because, I mean, for me, like, if, if I were Jesus, which... I'm not, and it's a very good thing that I'm not. His way is way better than anything that I could have come up with. But if I were him, I would have been like, I would have gotten annoyed, right? Like, do you not know what's going on, Jesus? And Jesus is just like, like if I were him, I would have been like, uh, yeah, I know what's going on. Guess what? It's me. I'm Jesus. Um, but instead, Jesus has a lot more patience, and he asked him, what is happening? And what he's doing here is he's giving Cleopas and his wife Mary the ability to tell their version of the story. Something that we, we know through um, psychiatrists and therapists and, and psychologists, what, what they say is one of the, one of the first steps and one of the, one of the best ways to begin um, the healing process after witnessing or maybe even experiencing something fairly traumatic, is to let them tell the story. And so Jesus is already giving them this chance to heal. Jesus is already healing them before he's even revealed himself to them. Now I love that. It's such, a, it's such a beautiful thing that Jesus gifts them with um, to be able to tell the story. And, and, and their response is, is quite poignant. Uh, they say, like, look, we were... You know, our, we had our chief rulers, and, and we had this leader. His name was Jesus, and he, he was put on the cross. And we had hoped, we had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. You notice that that hoped is put in the past tense. That was not, they were not presently feeling hope. Um, I, and I had, I had said this um, a few, like a few weeks ago, I, I made a, a Facebook post, whatever. Um, but I had, I had said, I had talked about this on uh, the day before Easter, 
um, and how uh, you know there was this um, there was this idea of hopelessness. And the day before Easter is known as Holy Saturday or or sometimes Silent Saturday. And and I had talked about how um, how this 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 idea that the, that these folks that Cleopas and Mary were 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 stuck. They were they were caught in this. Saturday, this, this in-between place of the cross and the resurrection. They were so caught up. And, and man, gosh, doesn't grief just really manifest itself in that way, right? Where, where we are so focused on the pain that we are currently experiencing that all other things tend to blur out. We can't see. We can't remember. Oh, yeah, there, there was this, this notion that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. We, we forget about those things, and we, ha- we basically don't allow ourselves to... to to hear that there is any kind of hope, that there is any kind of, uh, of goodness left in the world, we are caught, we are caught in this in-between place. We are, we are waiting for something to happen. Isn't that just so, so real, how, what they are going through and what they say? And, and you know, again, if I were Jesus, this, was, this would have been a place where I would have said, hey, can, can like, let, look, I'm going to reveal myself right here. I'm Jesus. I'm back. Like, it's going to be okay. Like, you're okay. Um, like, I, I would have wanted so desperately to, like, comfort them and give them that, that hope just right then and there. But again, Jesus is much more patient. In, in actuality, he, he doesn't sound very patient when he, he responds. He, he comes down pretty hard on them. He responds, how foolish are you and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Like he, he comes down hard on them and then he goes on to like, to like give them a lecture. Like here, here's all the scriptures that, are, that he said that concern me, like concern Jesus. Um, and so like I've, look, I've been in trouble before um, and I've, I've, I've had my fair share of times in the principal's office. And so I've received the lecture, but I, I have never received the entire Old Testament. Um, that... I know they didn't go through the entire Old Testament, but like, that's a lot. You know, they basically, Jesus spends the whole rest of the conversation um, going from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And, and like, he's, I mean, he's giving the full, the full gamut of everything that, that, that the prophets had ever said. And, and like I said, it sounds harsh the way, I mean, he calls them foolish. You know, it sounds, it sounds rough, but what he's really doing here and what they're really experiencing in this moment is he's giving them hope. He's telling them, like, guys, like, this is, this is all the scripture that is referring to what was going to happen. Yes, I was going, the Messiah was going to, uh, was going to suffer. This Messiah was going to die, but the Messiah was going to rise again. And so he's giving them this hope. He's giving them this, this moment where they can say, like, yes, you're right. Oh, my gosh, I forgot about this stuff. And so, like, he's giving them this, 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 this great, great talk about, like, the scriptures that are going through. And he does this in a way that is, that is I mean, it's getting them amped up, right? They, they're getting fired up. And if we, we read ahead um, to the scripture that we, we did read at the end, like, they, they reference back to this moment after they had realized that it was Jesus. And he, and he says, uh, they're saying, like, weren't our hearts, like, burning? Weren't they? Weren't we just, like, on fire for what was happening? Like, we, like right here and right now, Cleopas and Mary, they are getting jacked up for what's going on. Like, Jesus is going to rise again. Like, this is going to be awesome. And again, 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 if I were Jesus, I would have said, all right, yep, this is it. Like, we're getting fired up. Like, here's the scripture talking about how Jesus is going to rise again. And... Boom, I'm here. This is me. Like, I'm the guy, right? And so he would have, like, if I, if I would have done this, I would have wanted the victory laps, right? I would have wanted, like, I mean, you know, Jesus defeated death. He, like, was victorious over the grave. He even defeated the powers of sin. That's a big deal. <laughs> like, I would want to have been like, all right, I want all the celebrations. I want the trophies. I, and I would go around, like, high-fiving everybody, all the disciples, whatever. But, again... Jesus is way cooler than I am, um, and he's way more patient uh, and, and knew what he was doing. He wasn't ready to reveal himself 
just yet. They still didn't recognize him. And, and it wasn't one of those things where Jesus was wearing a disguise, right? I mean, he didn't have like a hat on, you know? Like, like they were looking at him face to face and they were, they, were, um, they were hearing what he was saying and it sound, probably sounded a lot like how Jesus would say it, but still, they were, it's, Luke was clear to say that they were kept from recognizing him. He wasn't ready to be revealed just yet. So they get to the end of their, uh, of their walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They get to um, Emmaus, the village, and they're approaching it. And, and Jesus, you know, he's, I mean, he's acting like he's about to like, walk away and go a separate direction, right? And, and, and Cleopas and Mary, they're like, wait, hold on, but what, what, like, it's getting evening. It's getting dark. Why don't you come and, and stay with us? Eat a meal. Maybe, maybe stay the night. And, and, and like this... Remember, like Jesus is a stranger at this point to them. And so I know it would have seemed like, you know, as we read the Gospels, this seems like it was somebody, something that would have been like maybe customary that, you know, they invite strangers into their household. But in reality, that actually wasn't that normal. Um, it was something that Jesus somewhat normalized with, with his disciples and with his followers by um, by having them like join in into other people's homes, they would gain meals and, and, and sleep the night. But throughout Jesus' ministry, this is something that would have been uh, a strange thing that Jesus had done. And so I love that Cleopas and Mary, they, I don't even know if they realize it, that they are inviting this stranger, this Jesus, um, into their home as Jesus had somewhat instilled in them. Like, I don't even know if they would have thought that this thing was, was odd anymore. And, and, you know, Jesus in the past had said multiple times, like, you know, if you, if you tend to the least of these, you are tending to me. And, 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 uh, and so, like, it, it, inviting this stranger in, it, it reminds me of, um, there was a poem. It was a, it's a pretty famous poem by um, Edwin Markham. And... Uh, you know, it used to be, I think it used to be recited a lot. Um, it was written like maybe 150 years ago or more. Um, but it's called How Great the Guest Came. And it's basically this poem about there's this, there's this man named Conrad the Cobbler. And uh, Conrad the Cobbler, so he was a shoemaker, um, and he um, receives a vision from God that Jesus um, was going to show up at his house. And um, so... It, you know, if you haven't heard it, like, he, his friends come over, and he's, he's basically excited. He gets his house all cleaned up. He's ready to go, and, and it's, he's telling his friends. And so uh, if you let me, I'll, I'll recite uh, the kind of second half of that poem when he's telling his friends about it. Old friends, good news at dawn today. As the cocks were scaring the night away, the Lord appeared in a dream to me and said, I am coming, your guest to be. So I've been busy with feet astir, stewing the, strewing the floor with branches of fir. The wall is washed and the shelf is shined, and over the rafter the holly twine. He comes today and the table is spread with milk and honey and the wheaten bread. His friends went home and his face grew still as he watched for the shadow across the sill. He lived all the moments o'er and o'er when the Lord should enter the lowly door. The knock, the call, the latch pulled up, the lighted face, the offered cup. He would wash the feet where the spikes had been. He would kiss the hands where the nails went in. And then at last he would sit with him and break the bread as the day grew dim. While the cobbler mused, there passed his pain, a beggar drenched by the driving rain. He called him in from the stony street and gave him shoes for his bruised feet. The beggar went, and there came a crone, her face with wrinkles of sorrow sown. A bundle of sticks bowed her back, and she was spent with the wrench and rack. He gave her his loaf and steadied her load, he took, so she took away on the weary road. Then to his door came a little child, lost and afraid in the world so wild. In the big dark world, catching it up, he gave it the milk and the waiting cup, and led it home to its mother's arms out of reach of the world's alarms. The day went down in the crimson west, and with it the hope of the blessed guest, and Conrad sighed as the world turned gray. Why is it, Lord, that your feet delay? Did you forget that this was the day? 
Then a soft in the silence, a voice he heard, Lift up your heart, for I kept my word. Three times I came to your friendly door. Three times my shadow was on your floor. I was the beggar with bruised feet. I was the woman you gave to eat. I was the child on the homeless street. So Conrad the cobbler, he, he, he took care of, of Jesus and, 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 and not really even knowing that he was doing so. He was so excited. He was ready to meet this risen Jesus, right? He, like he, was, going to, he was going to wash the feet where, the, the, where they were pierced. He was going to, to, to kiss his hands. He was going to, to give him bread. He was going to do all of these things. And, and slowly as the night went on, this, the, a beggar came and, and he, he, you know, he provided shoes for the bruised feet. Perhaps he was going to give those shoes to Jesus. He was, and, then, and then an old woman came in and, and he gave her the bread. Like, we know that he was going to provide that bread for Jesus. And, and then the child came and he gave the, the, the waiting cup, the cup of entry where someone would come in and they would provide the cup. Uh, like, that was intended for Jesus. But then, you know, Jesus reveals that, yes, I was there the whole time. I was all three of those, of those people. And so and you took care of, of these folks. And in doing so, you took care of me. And so going back to our scripture, when Luke and Cleopas took care of Jesus, when took care of this stranger, when he, when they invited him in and took him in, gave him bread, they did so for Jesus. So this is um, one of the last things I want to kind of focus on. Um, So Jesus comes in. And they're, they're sharing a meal together. And what Jesus does is he takes the bread. He blesses it. He breaks it. And then he gives it. And suddenly, he's revealed. Like everyone, like uh, Cleopas and his wife Mary, they, they, they see, oh my gosh, it's Jesus the whole time. And, and, and then he disappears. <laughs> and so it's... It, <laughs> Very quick, like blink if you miss kind of moment, but, but it's one of those things where the, the bread is incredibly significant. If you, if you fast forward to kind of the end of the passage, um, Luke in his gospel said that Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So the bread, the bread does a few things. It, it reminds them of that strange moment at the Passover meal, right? When, when Jesus, he, he took the bread at that point in time, and that was, that was normal. And then he, he blessed it, which was another normal thing to do during the Seder meal. And then he, he, he broke it and passed it around. And again, all things that were pretty, pretty fairly normal. And then he said something that wasn't so. He said, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. That was strange. <laughs> and, and, and you know that that, would, that story would have passed on even in the short amount of time between when Jesus did that versus when Jesus rose on Easter Sunday. And, and, and so when, when, uh, when Cleopas and, and, when they're, and when his wife Mary are looking at when Jesus does this, their mind is going back to a few days earlier when Jesus did that. And, and suddenly, like, it all is starting to, you know, The dots are connecting, right? It reminds them of the Passover meal. And then it reminds them of another thing. It reminds them of something that Jesus also said. I am the bread of life. They remembered. Oh yeah, I remember Jesus saying that, that I, that Jesus is the bread of life. Then the breaking of the bread reminds them that that bread was indeed broken. Jesus' body was broken. And then it reminds them, perhaps not, perhaps not literally, but in truth, we all have a hand in the breaking of the bread. All of this stuff is coming forward, you know, 
Cleopas and Mary are, are just like, oh my goodness, like all of these things are happening. It's starting to come together. I, like I, I, I was selfish. I was there at the cross. Like I remember when Jesus died, I, w- I saw it with my own eyes. And, and like I remember that this, this thing and, and I did nothing about it. Like I, 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 was, I just stood there. Like I didn't say anything. And, and so all of their like sins, all of their selfishness, all of their self-preservation, whatever it was looking like, that was coming to the forefront of their brains and they were feeling the guilt and feeling the thing. But look, guess what? I mean, wait a second, this is Jesus. Like he, the stranger turned out to be Jesus the whole time. Like, I, like he is, he's alive, like he's resurrected. Like, what does this mean? Like, oh my gosh. Like, so, so if Jesus is resurrected, then that means that when Jesus said that he would rise from the dead in three days, then that means that that came true. And if that came true, then all of the other promises that Jesus gave in his life, those are also coming true. And if that is coming true, then that means that when, I, I heard it as Cleopas and Mary, we heard it on the cross, Jesus looking up to God and saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. So if that is true, then that means that there is grace here in all of this mess that not only did Jesus rise from the dead, but he has forgiven us all on our behalf. He went and did that. And isn't that how it is when we encounter the risen Jesus? When we encounter the risen Jesus, when we meet the risen Jesus, the resurrected one, then we are met. Yes, we are met with our sins. Yes, we are met with our hardships. Yes, we are met with all these things that are that, that our, our, our failures and our shortcomings. We are met with all of that. But simultaneously in that moment, we are met with the one who defeated all of it. What does that mean? Like I said, there's, it's one thing to know what Jesus could do, but to believe what Jesus will do, what Jesus is doing in you. Look to the person next to you right now and say, look, you are forgiven. And then look to the person next to you and say, he is risen. He is risen. Hey, there we go, yes. He is. When Cleopas and, and, and Mary realized this, they, they leapt from their seats. I don't even know if they got to taste the bread, but they, they went out and rushed back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples, it is true, he is risen. And all of the grace that that involves is pouring over all of us. The Cleopas and the Mary that left Jerusalem to head to Emmaus, were completely different people than the Cleopas and Mary that returned to Jerusalem. They had encountered the risen Jesus and they could not help but tell anybody who would listen, Jesus is risen. What will that do to our lives? So my prayer for us today, as we sing this uh, last song, my prayer is that we all allow ourselves to encounter the risen Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. Jesus, meet us here in this place. That as we close in today's service and as we uh, go forward out into the world, God, that we are open to you that you reveal yourself to us in such a powerful way that we are transformed and completely new. God, we pray that you allow us the strength and the courage to not only be transformed, but be a part of the transformation of others. That we just can't help it. That we just can't stop, but share the hope your son, Jesus, rose from the dead and is inviting us all to resurrect with him. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship. Who am I that 
Out of Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated with us in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. What does it look like to fully believe in what Jesus is doing in you and with you and for you? Let us go in peace and recognize the reality of the resurrected Jesus. Have a good week. See you.